Hi, I'm Daniel Tosh, host of a new podcast called Tosh Show. I'll be interviewing people that I find interesting, so not celebrities, and certainly not comedians. We'll be covering topics like religion, travel, sports, gambling, but mostly it will be about being a working mother. If you're looking for a podcast that will educate and inspire, or one that will really make you think, this isn't the one for you. Listen to Tosh Show on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy is the greatest murder mystery in American history. That's Rob Briner. Rob called me, Soledad O'Brien, and asked me what I knew about this crime. We'll ask who had the motive to assassinate a sitting president. Then we'll pull the curtain back on the cover-up. The American people need to know the truth. Listen to Who Killed JFK on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Phoenix, Arizona, and surrounding Desert Mesa, <laughs> we have some big news. Uh, you guys bought so many tickets. We have actually changed theaters to a bigger theater. Yeah, we moved from the Van Buren, which is very beautiful, right around the block to the amazing Orpheum Theater so that more of you Phoenixidians <laughs> uh, can show up and see us because we want to see as many of you as possible. Yeah, otherwise everything is the same. So if you have tickets to uh, that Van Buren show, then they count for the Orpheum show, obviously. Mm -hmm. And now there are a whole lot more tickets for you desert dwellers, and I can't wait to see you all and your lovely tans and your scorpions and your tarantulas and your rattlesnakes. Yep, so we'll be there on Wednesday, October 24th at the Orpheum Theater. And if you haven't gotten tickets yet, you can get them by going to sysklive.com, our clearinghouse for Stuff You Should Know Live. Welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and sitting across from me is Charles W. Chuckus Chinkus <laughs> Bryant. And sitting to your right is ghost producer Casper. Nobody. It was Ramsey, guest producer Ramsey. We've got like all these new guest producers coming on, hot and heavy. I know. Jerry had to, she had to leave today, and I think everyone's busy. And so someone came in. There's also a distinct lack of interest I've picked up on. <laughs> Boy, remember the days when people used to jump at a chance to sit in here? Oh, yeah. Now they're like, uh, I've got to mail something. <laughs> I know. Used to be like, oh, my gosh. Jerry's gone. Let me do it. Let me do it. Yeah. No, and they grew up. <laughs> yeah. And then they grew up. And um, now we have our little uh, dunking bird mm -hmm. to peck the key. Yeah. The R record button. Yeah. Just going back and forth thinking about where its life went wrong. Just us. <laughs> <laughs> Just us, Chuck, and a guy named Genghis, Dingus Khan. Do you pronounce it Dingus or Genghis or Chingus? Are you being serious? I know it's not Dingus, but I've also <laughs> seen it spelled <clears throat> in a way that would suggest you... It's Genghis, see, you Dingus. You pronounce it <laughs> Chingus. Oh, really? I think I have heard that. Mm -hmm. But we're going to go with the, the general Genghis pronunciation, Okay. Right, although his, uh, what was his birth name, uh, Timujin? Mm-hmm. Doesn't even, Gen Genghis Khan isn't even his real name, everybody, so calm down. <laughs> it's Temujin, or Temujin. Man, did you see that statue? I've seen it before, yes, it's enormous. Have you seen it in person? No. No. I've not yet been to Mongolia. That's something else, man. I will one day, though. Yeah, no, it's, it's the world's biggest equestrian statue, and with good reason. It's like 40 meters or 130 feet tall. Yeah. That's an enormous statue. It's pretty impressive. Whether whether you're on a horse or not, that's a big old statue, right? Sure. I almost didn't say old. <laughs> and I think it's made of like uh, 250 tons of stainless steel, which means it, it rinses clean really well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it looks like, I saw the wide shot, it doesn't look like one of those that's, you know, surrounded by Burger Kings. Oh, good. Looks like there's a lot of land around it. Well, Mongolia has a lot of land, a lot of undeveloped land from what I understand. Yeah, this was an interesting one because depending on what kind of historian you are, uh, he is a either a revered mastermind or a scorned uh, butcher. Butcher, yeah. I know. He's actually, you think, both. Well, of course he was both. But, but yeah, sure. there, there are definite camps for sure. Like like a lot of people, um, I've seen them called the pro, 
Genghis camp. Mm-hmm. Um, the pro G. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that they're, they're all about like all the cultural transmission that happened under his, his rule. Yeah. Um, or all of the, um, all the new innovative laws or religious, religious tolerance was another one. Yeah. And, and yes, you like all that stuff happened. It's not in dispute. Like there are a lot of things that we'll talk about that were really positive. But he's also directly responsible for the deaths of about 35 million people. Yeah, the anti-G. Over a 25-year 25 25 period. Mm-hmm. That's a ridiculous amount of death of people who had Genghis Khan not been born and, you know, decided to lead a conquest yeah. would probably otherwise not have died violently. That's a big mark in his favor or against him. Well, my morality <laughs> just switched off there for a second. So you got the pro-G, uh-huh. the anti-G, yep. and the alley-G. Right. That's the third camp. Yeah. The Booyakasha Booyakasha. <laughs> I miss that. Oh, it's good stuff. It is. But they tried to bring it back, remember, and it was like— Oh, really? Was there a part two? No. Or a 2.0? They, that's, that's the problem. They didn't do new stuff. It was just him introducing old stuff. And it was like, we want more new stuff. We've all seen this oh, old stuff that. a bunch. It was like for a month on FX. But they shot new hosting uh, segments? Yes, that were like 15 seconds long. Oh, so basically they said, hey, Sasha Baron Cohen, how'd you like to make another X amount of dollars right. by showing up for a day? How would you like to do the, the Ollie G version of SYSK Selects? <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. All right. I'm not going to examine that one too closely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're talking about Ali G. I mean, Genghis Khan, right? Yeah. And just some um, large statistics right off the bat as far as his um, his his influence. Well, not his influence, but his rule and sheer numbers. Yeah. This is the reason we're still talking about him, not just because he killed so many people. Yeah. Agreed. Um by the time, you know, of course, everyone knows he was a great conqueror who just kept branching out further and further. And right. this is how far he reached. Eventually, in modern day terms, he would reach Austria. Austria. He banged on the door of Austria. His, his, yeah. his, his son did. Just get out a world map and look at where Mongolia is. <laughs> so Austria, Finland, mm-hmm. Croatia, Hungary, Poland, Vietnam, Burma, Japan, and Indonesia. Twelve million Contiguous square miles. Which is the size of? Africa. Again? Amazing. Yeah. (laughs) And then to put that in context, you know, the the great Roman Empire, that was about half the size of the United States. Yeah, the the Roman Empire was half the size of the United States. Yeah. It took them 400 years to amass that. Yeah. In 25 years, Genghis Khan had an empire the size of Africa. Yeah, and then at the time— the uh, population of the world was about 7 billion people. Uh, the Mongolian Empire was about 3 billion of that. So it's just astounding. It is astounding. And, and to put it in like true cultural or true historic context, at the time, in say like the early, early 13th century, the Mongols were the Mongols, a bunch of nomadic tribes, tribes on the steppes of Mongolia. China was a well-established and um, fairly advanced patchwork of dynasties. Yeah. Um, you had like Europe growing in the, well, they were in the Middle Ages, but they were like the Renaissance is coming not too long. Yeah. Um, you had the Native Americans over in America doing sure. their thing, Africa doing their thing. So there's all these different things going on in the world. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this tiny little bunch of people who are, aren't even into agriculture mm-hmm. take over Eurasia. Yeah. In 25 years. Yeah. Out of nowhere and kill 35 million people. Yeah. Out of nowhere. It'd be like if if Polynesia suddenly rose up and took over the Americas yeah. in 25 years. They just assembled and said, we're taking over. And they were just so ferocious that um, America just didn't even know what to do and was overrun by them. Yeah. And their, uh, their rule was not long lasting for a lot of the reasons that mm-hmm. – there's a lot of ironies, you know, a lot of the reasons that they were able to spread so fast ended up being their undoing. But um, this is all just set up fodder. Yeah. We haven't <laughs> even gotten into it yet. So let's let let's do start. OK. Shoo. Back in uh, people think the best guess is probably I think 1185. I, I saw there was a, a kid 
named Temujin, mm-hmm. 1162, I'm sorry. And uh, he was born uh, in a place called, well, along the Onan River, near Ulaanbaatar, which is a great name, but that's the capital of Mongolia. There's five A's in that. Mm-hmm. That's it's a it. lot of A's. That's a lot of A's. And uh, this this kid, this Temujin, who would grow up to be Genghis Khan, was not uh, Genghis Khan material from the outset. No, he was, um, he, well, he was a middle brother, mm-hmm. and apparently both younger and older brother outshone him. Yeah, he was very much the Jam Brady of his family. <laughs> he was, because apparently little brother was a much better athlete and a better, you know, arrow shooter, or I guess you would call them archers. Um, <laughs> kind of better at everything, and then his older brother picked on him. Um, he was not, he was illiterate. He wasn't, like, formally schooled or super smart. Right, right. But, I mean, in his defense, neither were most of the people he knew or sure. lived on the steps. Yeah, it's not like his two brothers, like, <laughs> got their doctorates, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> their PhDs. Yeah, in kicking butt. Uh, well, that's true. Um, but he was, uh, he, there was, I mean, reading, I wish I knew more about this, this whole era, because it sounds like it was just, a crazy time, especially over there, where people would be like, if I want something, I'm just going to go take it. Yeah. If I want that tribe gone, I'm going to go kill them. If I want those ladies and her children, I'm going to kidnap them. Mm-hmm. And that was just sort of how the land was ruled. Yeah. It was kind of not chaos, but just brute force. Uh, lawless. Yeah, pretty lawless. And uh, you, you were you were loyal to your tribe or your clan, mm-hmm. um, and your tribe or clan was nomadic, and you lived by the horse. And yeah, you you there was a lot of war between these tribes on the steps. Yeah, and tiny was, tiny wars. Like 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 you said, kidnapping. Like you would kidnap your wife. That's mm-hmm. how you got your wife. Was you go kidnap her from another tribe and be like, "You're my wife now." That's how his mother came about, right? Yes, that's how he came about. Was well, his father kidnapped yeah, his mother? His father was the chief of his tribe. Um, oh, what's his father's name? Yasugi. Nice. And Yasugi kidnapped uh, Holun, Hulun. Yeah, there's a lot of umlauts in there. I don't know how the umlaut uh, represents Mongolian uh, dialect. Well, we're going to do it German style. So her name is Hulun. <laughs> is that pretty German? Mertley Crew. <laughs> so she was kidnapped. And I, this is the thing, like, I have no context to put this in. Mm-hmm. If this was a common thing, was she like, oh, I'm being kidnapped, okay, like, I, I, I guess I'm 18 now or something. Like, this is just a normal course of events for her, so it didn't impact her? I don't know. Or is that just a ridiculous thing to even think? And, like, yes, if you were kidnapped and taken from your tribe and made to be some dude's wife unwillingly, it doesn't matter where it happened or when it happened. It was a horrific experience. I think it was, I mean, I think it was that and just sort of the way it was. Women were just, had no recourse or say in anything Mm -hmm. at the time. So it was both. But, like, I I think I know what you're saying, though. Like, you know, she had these children and they were, quote, family. Mm -hmm. But what is, you know, what does that mean in that context? Yeah. Is it a family if mom's like looking for an escape route for right. the whole life? Right. Yeah. Um, either way, it was not like people were courting one another back then. Right. So, um, Yasugi, right? That's mm-hmm. what we decided on? Yes. Uh, Yasugi was the chief, like I said, of the clan, of the tribe. Uh, a very powerful dude. And he was poisoned, actually. He died by poisoning when Temujin was nine. And that was bad news for Temujin, his mom, and his two brothers. Yeah, they were just sort of kicked out of this new tribe. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure why. I guess because that he was the son of, of yeah. Okay, they didn't want anybody being like, oh, by the way, I'm the rightful heir. Right. I I should really be the chief of this tribe. I'm very surprised that they didn't just kill all of them. Yeah, because that's kind of the way it usually went. Yeah. So yeah, they were kicked out. Uh, so he had a rough childhood. They were not. They had to scavenge for food. Um, I reckon it toughened him up a little bit. Mm-hmm. But um, as our article points out, that he uh, it kind of gave him a will to – and probably ticked him off. So he had anger and will. Vengeance. And vengeance all rolled up into one, which says a lot about, like, the man that he would become, I think. For sure. Um, so he and his family make it. So, uh, not all of his family. There's, there's a story called the secret history of the Mongols, 
and it was written in about 1240, so mm-hmm. shortly after Genghis Khan's death. We don't know who the author was, but that's the primary source for most of the auto or the biography of Genghis Khan. There's, they know a lot, or <clears throat> a at least lot, because to. somebody sat down and wrote this, yeah. and we'll see eventually why. Um, but the um, that's where we're getting all of this information, which is also why if you listen to the history of Genghis Khan, a lot of it sounds like a string of fables and tales wrapped For together. Sure. But historians tend to think that there's some some kernel of truth or just a, a outright truth to most of it. Should we take a break? Uh, yeah. All right. We'll take a break and we'll talk about what uh, young Timujin was like. Hi, I'm Daniel Tosh, host of a new podcast called Tosh Show, brought to you by iHeart Podcasts. Why am I getting into the podcast game now? Well, it seemed like the best way to let my family know what I'm up to instead of visiting or being part of their incessant group text. I'll be interviewing people that I find interesting, so not celebrities and certainly not comedians. I'll be interviewing my plumber, my stylist, my wife's gynecologist. We'll be covering topics like religion, travel, sports, gambling, but mostly it will be about being a working mother. If you're looking for a podcast that will educate and inspire or one that will really make you think, this isn't the one for you. But it will be entertaining to a very select few because you don't make it to your mid-40s with IBS without having a story or two to tell. Join me as I take my place among podcast royalty like Joel Olstein and Lance Bass. Those are words I hope I'd never have to say. Listen to Toss Show on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy is the greatest murder mystery in American history. That's Rob Reiner. Rob called me, Soledad O'Brien, and asked me what I knew about this crime. I know 60 years later, new leads are still emerging. To me, an award-winning journalist, that's the making of an incredible story. And on this podcast, you're going to hear it told by one of America's greatest storytellers. We'll ask... Who had the motive to assassinate a sitting president? My dad thought JFK screwed us at the Bay of Pigs, and then he screwed us after the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'll reveal why Lee Harvey Oswald isn't who they said he was. I was under the impression that Lee was being trained for a specific operation. Then we'll pull the curtain back on the cover-up. The American people need to know the truth. Listen to Who Killed JFK on the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, so we said that he was a bit of a crybaby, got picked on, wasn't very athletic or strong, Mm -hmm. but he had charm, he had chutzpah, he had charisma, and a little bit of moxie. And, and definitely you got to throw in some moxie. And apparently he was able through his charisma to to talk people into helping him out. And that became sort of a trait through his life. Right. And they give a couple of examples. Um, one time he was going after a horse thief and he just ran upon a stranger and kind of convinced the guy to not only uh, give him a horse but mm-hmm. to help him out. Yeah, he really attracted people into his orbit from what I understand. Yeah, he was like – like Gil- like Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> it's funny because I knew I was trying to think of someone legitimately, and I knew that you were <laughs> headed down the different you know path. the opposite of that? Uh, what else? There was another uh, time that he had a bride-to-be, uh, or maybe I think he was married. Yeah, I think that's the case. And she was kidnapped because that's how it went. Mm-hmm. And so he went to the leader of another tribe and said, hey— Take this sable skin. It was one of my wedding gifts. And he goes, oh, nice. Yeah, he was pretty impressed apparently oh. because he helped him rescue the wife and then pledged his allegiance to him as an ally for life. I yeah. Guess. He said, not only am I going to help you get your wife, you're going to go on to do great things, and I want to be there with you. <laughs> Love me. <laughs> so um, there's just tons of stories like that, like yeah. early stories where like he was held – prisoner by he was kidnapped himself and escaped by beating the guy watching him with the wooden collar that he had fastened around his neck Mm -hmm. there's just tons of stories like that that if you put it together you can kind of see this guy develop over time right sure 
But eventually, he probably as, hit the weights. Eventually, right? Yeah, <laughs> as as um as he grows up and develops, and more and more people kind of come into his orbit and want to help him out, he starts putting that that charisma and that vengeance to, I guess, productive use. <laughs> And he's, he assembles, like, his own tribe and other tribes. He starts allying with other tribes. And the tribes that don't go along with it, he slaughters in war. Mm-hmm. Um, and he would he was known for having, like, an eye for other talent, which would aid him tremendously throughout his years as a, a conqueror. But, for example, if you were a, a good enemy soldier, and he noted that in battle— yeah. There was a good chance that you were going to end up a field commander on his side yeah. after the battle was over and he beat your your guys. Uh-huh. And there's actually a story where the, his horse was shot out from under him. And after his his group won the battle, the Mongols won the battle, um, he wanted to know who shot that arrow. And the guy on the other side stood up and said, it was me. And he said, you... Your name is Jebe now, which means arrow, mm-hmm. and you're going to become a field commander for me. And he went on to be one of the best he ever had. And the guy was like, "Is he messing with me? Right? Are you Am about, I about to get my head kill me? off?" Yeah, <laughs> uh, but that was a that was pretty par for the course with him. And so through these actions, he started assembling like an army, and became yeah. the leader of the steps. Yeah, and people, like you said, if they challenged him, they were squashed. Mm-hmm. He um, he had a surrender or die policy, which apparently if you literally did not fight, and you were just like, okay, we're all yours. Right. Apparently, he was okay to you. He wasn't known for torturing people. Um, I don't know if he, you know, I don't know. want to say he was kind to them, but I think he kind of wanted his subjects to be happy and productive. Right. So if they didn't fight him, he was like, all right, you're, you're part of the big extended Khan family. Come here. <laughs> Come here, you. Thank you for your kingdom. Although he isn't Khan at this point still. No, that didn't take place until, I believe, 1206. Yeah, that's when they uh, the Mongol tribes all got together. They had uh, a great assembly called uh, uh, Kurilai, and they said, you know what? You're the man. You're Genghis Khan now. Mm-hmm. We are all on your team because, quite frankly, we're scared of you. Right. We're scared. <laughs> we're so scared. So and he was like, hey, that's fine. Yeah. So Genghis Khan, they think – Khan means ruler, yeah, indisputably. Genghis, they're not 100% sure what they meant by it because it can mean ocean or just. So they think they were saying like supreme, like the leader all the way to the ocean. Sure. And then, then you run into to Triton. You don't want to mess with him. Right. But up to Triton's area, this guy is the leader. So that's what they meant by it, like ocean leader. He wasn't Aquaman. No. <laughs> so they're unified now, and he said, I have to, like, I have to assemble a nation here. I've got all these tribes. I want a unified people. Yeah, that was a big move. It was, and it was a smart move. Um, and all these old clans got together, people that were enemies, um, joined forces. I don't know if they became, you know, best buds or anything. Well, the, one of the things they did is they renounced these old rivalries. Yeah. They um they stopped warring with each other. They stopped robbing one another. Yeah. Um and they started identifying not as these individual clans but as Mongols. Yeah, and like strength in numbers. I think they realized this this could benefit us all. Right. If we're one big powerful group. Right, but numbers is relative though, man. Like sure. from what I saw at its peak, the army of Genghis Khan had about a hundred thousand men. Yeah, which is peanuts. It is peanuts. So why were they – should we get into why they were successful yet? Or this, Yeah. Okay. So why were they successful? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, a few reasons. The, probably the one of the biggest is, is these dudes could ride horses mm-hmm. and shoot arrows like nobody's business. Yeah. They were incredible uh, – Cal, uh, they had an incredible cavalry. Mm-hmm. He was one of the first that whoever wrote that article you sent, um, that one historian, he was great. Yeah. So he pointed out that he uh, he realized that that the cavalry didn't need to be followed by an infantry, which was a huge advantage, I guess, in battle. Yeah. You needed far fewer guys. Yeah, and just get everyone up on a horse. Yep. Uh, they were incredible archers. They could, their accuracy was unmatched. They could fire an arrow, apparently like over 300 yards 
accurately. Mm-hmm. Um, these horses were awesome. They were grass fed. They could live off the land. They had this armor that was really lightweight and flexible. So, you know, at the time, they were fighting people in much heavily armored uh, apparel. So they uh, they were they could move around better. You right. know, on their horses, they were firing arrows, and they had these little short swords, and they had this thing called a hooked lance. And they're like, a lance is all right. It's it's cool, I guess, to poke someone off a horse. But what if you can poke them or grab them? Mm-hmm. So they added a hook to the lance, a very simple feature. Right. And it really changed things. It was like a modern uh, evolution in weaponry. Right. So these are just a few of the reasons. One of, uh, <clears throat> one of the others is... Tactics and strategy. Yeah. Uh, he would scout out before battles for weeks sometimes. He wouldn't just go as, like, as brutish as they were. They would spend a lot of time doing research and spying. Yeah. And really kind of figuring out a game plan. Like, like if they were going to sack a city, like, they knew where the trade li- or the supply lines were. Sure. Escape routes, um, you know, all that kind of stuff. All the stuff you need to know to sack a city. Yeah. <laughs> one of the other things, so so, p- part one, a, a, I saw it called the quantum leap in military strategy and technology. Yeah. Okay? That was the first thing. The other thing is something you touched on o- earlier, their surrender or die policy. Yeah. Right? So their military prowess combined with their tactics and the, their policy of if you don't just say, yes, that's yeah. fine. We don't want to fight. We're going to kill everybody, mm-hmm. J- just about everybody. And they were actually pretty smart about it, too. They'd find, like, the skilled craftsmen in sure. some cities and Engineers. be like, we're going to spare your life because you're now a Mongol. Yeah. you got to move to Mongolia, by the way. Um, but they would just kill so many people that the, a lot of historians have tried to figure out why were they so ferocious. And there have actually been a number of theories that have been put up one is so apparently so Genghis Khan was a uh, he was into shamanism that was his religion yeah but he was like fervently religious yeah. about shamanism and there was like a great god of the sky who um, I think is analogous to Vishnu maybe mm-hmm. in Hinduism and this so this god supposedly gave him a vision that he should become conqueror of the world yeah and so some people have said well. He, you know, if you opposed him, you were opposing his God, and so there was no room for that, and that's what made him so ferocious. Yeah. Um, probably the best explanation, though, is that if some, if like one of their hundred thousand horsemen died, that was a big deal, right? Yeah. So to save their numbers, they were better off not fighting. So by slaughtering an entire city, yeah, that word about that gets around the area. So when those guys show up to your city, there's a pretty good chance that if they say surrender or die, you're going to surrender. And so the the Mongols didn't have to sacrifice a single person. Yeah, and also get the idea. I mean, we're going to talk about his major uh, sieges, but he also had a lot of smaller skirmishes with just kind of regional tribes, I think. And Mm -hmm. I got the idea that he wouldn't send all his dudes in there. He would send in a small amount of people as possible. Right. Because they were so fierce and good at what they did, he didn't need to. And then that also reduced the chances of loss of life, I guess. And then so the smallest units, those that 100,000-man army boiled down to units as small as 10 people. Yeah. That was the individual unit was a 10-person cavalry group. Yeah. And, yeah, you could just say send five groups in or 1,000 groups in or whatever. Yeah. There you go. And he would also – he would also – as he went, he would pick up whatever weaponry and tactics that other armies used and use those. Because one thing that um, was pretty clear in reading this, Genghis Khan did not like walls in, no. wall, in walled cities. I saw that too. It ticked him off, yeah. especially for some reason. Why would you do that? <laughs> no. Yeah. So he, uh, you know, he, he got catapults and uh, things like that. And he would, he would do some awful things like with ladders and catapults. He would fling diseased animals like that wasn't Mm -hmm. I don't know he wasn't the only one to do that Mm -hmm. but uh, some of this seems like lore though the thing with the cats and the birds yeah he told one city (laughs) that he'd spare them if they gave him a thousand cats and ten thousand birds and they gathered up their ten thousand birds which I guess they had and the thousand cats and gave them to him 
And then he set the cats and the birds on fire and flung them over the walls to start fires in the city. Well, supposedly tied cotton oh, gotcha. to them and set that on fire. Oh, well, that's much better. But I'm sure the fire spreads. It does seem apocryphal. Yeah, I, I don't know if I believe that. Apocryphal, by the way, I just learned in like the last year or so means that word made up. You didn't know that's you never heard the word or no, I've heard it it plenty of times. I just didn't realize. I always assumed it meant like biblical and end of times. Oh, interesting. Because it's resemblance to apocalypse. I've got one more for you. What's that? I just this week learned what coup de gras actually means. I thought it meant like the cream of the crop, the ultimate. It's the death blow. Like, there's nothing after it, not because it's the best. Right. Because you just had your head cut off. Yeah, the coup de gras. Yeah. Yeah, the final blow. Just learned that this week. Yeah, I think I knew that. You know what word I used to always get wrong was uh, dubious. Did you think it meant pot? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Can you score me some dubious? Did you ever listen to <laughs> Funk Dubious? They were like this rap group from the 90s. Yeah, that had like a I remember Funk hits. Dubious. They were great. They were they all they wanted to do was have fun, in the midst of like the whole gangster rap thing. Funk dubious. Funk dubious. I totally remember that. Yeah. Boy, they they just went away. I haven't heard that name in. I think they had like one album. And that was it. What was their big hit? Oh, I don't even remember, but I'll bet it had to do with pot. <laughs> Probably so. Um, all right, so he's got Mongolia pretty well taken care of wait, at this wait, wait. point. Wait, wait, wait. What did you think dubious meant? I, I made oh. a joke instead of letting you answer. No, I don't I don't remember what I thought it meant, but I think okay. I just used to get it wrong. We'll go back to funk dubious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he's got Mongolia pretty well in control, and he is insatiable, though, uh, Genghis Khan is. He starts looking around, and he's like, China is big. You look pretty, pretty, pretty. And I think... Even though they are wealthy and tough and have a lot of dudes uh, to fight, I think I can take them because mm-hmm. I'm Genghis Khan. Which is a nutso thing to say at that time. Sure. Especially depending on which of the, the dynasties in China you were talking about because I think there were at least three major ones. Well, he's time. like, all of them. Let's just go one at a time. Yeah. So that's, that's what he what, did. Yeah, that's exactly what he did. He started with the— uh, and there's, uh, I'm sorry, everybody. I'm having trouble keeping up with all of the names. But the Tanguts? Yeah, the kingdom of uh, Zhi Jia is how I would probably pronounce it. Is that Not right? Not Dixia Chang. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's about that. <laughs> Zhi Jia. <laughs> yeah, Zhi Jia and the Tanguts. And uh, I think this was sort of a test, his biggest test mm. militarily at the time. Yeah, it was... He'd been fighting other tribes on the steps that, to consolidate them and killing off the resistors. They didn't have cities. The Tangits were the first ones that he encountered that had, like, cities with walls that were fortified that he needed to figure out how to lay siege to. Yeah, and he, he did to the point where uh, the king finally said, All right, uh, you are my master, here are my troops, and here's a princess bride as well. <laughs> right. Because I've heard you get around. Yeah. And uh, Genghis Khan said, as you wish. That's right. Isn't that what he said? I think so. Okay. Uh, So then next he said, all right, how about this other region, uh, the Qin Kingdom? And he faced a 70,000-man army, and it said virtually wiped it out Mm -hmm. in this article. So he's working his way up here now. Yeah. So he actually hit the chins twice, from what I understand. And this How Stuff Works article says it happened in 2013. So I'll bet the chins were quite surprised to see Genghis Khan show up five years ago. Yeah, I wonder why. He, I mean, it says that came, he came back and got a bunch of silk and gold and got a bunch of engineers. I wonder if that was the the purpose of that mission. Maybe. was like, hey, I don't think we properly raided them. Yeah, because this was two years after the first one. I guess that's all all it was, that he wanted some more silk and gold. And, again, appropriating weapons uh, like crossbows, catapults, and, because it's China, uh, early versions of explosives. Right. And so he's using all this stuff. He's not married to just the hook pole and just the saber. He'll try out anything he sees <laughs> works, right? Yeah. So he's he's knocked out the first two dynasties. He's brought them under his control. He now controls a significant portion of China all of the steps around Mongolia. Yeah. And he's got his sets, his sights set on the biggest one of the three, the Jin Dynasty. Yes. And he um, actually got in 
contact with them or else they got in contact with him first. But the emperor of the Jin dynasty, this is an advanced civilization at this point. Very wealthy, maybe the most advanced and wealthy civilization on the planet at the time. Maybe. Genghis Khan is a backwoods redneck horse rider (laughs) who just happened to get lucky a couple of times, caught the other two dynasties slipping. Well, sure. That's as what the emperor of the of the Jin dynasty is thinking. At yeah, he's point, thinking right? you're going to be my slave. Yeah, he's like, you've done pretty good, kid. I'll tell you what, I'll let you, I'll let you look over my land in the south. You'll be my vassal, and um, here, here's a princess bride. I hear you like him. Yeah, but uh, it did not work out that way. No, it didn't. He actually successfully defeated the most advanced, wealthiest society. On the planet at mm-hmm. the time, the jinns. Yep, slaughtered thousands and thousands of people. Well, that's how you do it, I guess. And these three campaigns, these these are huge, enormous campaigns. China was extremely populous at the time. And the number of people who died, most of the people who died under Genghis Khan's rule through war and conquest mm-hmm. happened during these three China campaigns. Yeah. About 30, about 30 million people died. And this is over... I mean, 10 years, I think. Less than 10 years. Yeah, I think so. It's nuts, man. Yeah, so he wanted to uh, continue going, uh, I guess, west. In 1219, he made his way through modern-day Central Asia, like Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Iran. uh, And the Shah Muhammad there said... He killed an ambassador that they had sent forward uh, from a trading caravan... And he had a big walled city, and he's like, I'm going to be fine. I'm not sweating this guy. Right. And uh, he burned the city down, Genghis Khan did, and including a 1,000 of the soldiers who were in a mosque mm-hmm. hiding out, killed about 100,000 people. But, of course, like you said earlier, he spared the, the skilled craftsmen and workers. Right. And this is the, the Khwarazm, Khwaraz, and I even practiced this one, <laughs> the Khwarazm. Quarism? I think so. Empire, which um, its capital city that he sacked is now in Uzbekistan, but I've seen it called mostly like Afghanistan, Iran, for the most part. This is the the area it covered. Iran is what I see it mostly compared to these days. Yeah, and things are starting to get a little out of hand at this point, and, and it's basically sort of due to the fact that he there was he went too far. There were too many people, too much land. Mm-hmm. Um, when you control your, I think the the guy who um, wrote that article you sent said that they weren't producers of anything. The Mongols, yeah, right, or uh, or tradesmen. They were conquerors. That's it. Yeah, and that's not like you got to diversify. <laughs> From what I understand, they didn't have a written language. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't do anything. They just conquered people and took over your land, and then leached off of you. Yeah, which is a good skill to to get going. But if that's all you can do, mm-hmm. I think he likened it to a shark needing to feed. Right. Like eventually you run out of lands to conquer. And then in the interior, it's such a huge corporation at this point, right. it gets unwieldy. So Genghis Khan recognized this at some point. He yeah. saw that he had basically a, a change of heart about agriculture, about walled cities, about a sedentary lifestyle. Yeah. And I I think he mostly saw like, oh, you can make way more wealth this way. So he turned from conquering as much toward figuring out how to administer this area that he conquered. Mm -hmm. Again, Eurasia is conquered. It's under this guy's, this guy's had never, never been united before and hasn't been united since. Even under Soviet... Soviet rule. Mm-hmm. The Genghis Khan's empire was bigger yeah. than that, right? Um, and so he's put it together, and he's like, yeah, what do I do now? And we'll talk about that after this message. How about that? Yes.
Hi, I'm Daniel Tosh, host of a new podcast called Tosh Show, brought to you by iHeart Podcasts. Why am I getting into the podcast game now? Well, it seemed like the best way to let my family know what I'm up to instead of visiting or being part of their incessant group text. I'll be interviewing people that I find interesting, so not celebrities and certainly not comedians. I'll be interviewing my plumber, my stylist, my wife's gynecologist. We'll be covering topics like religion, travel, sports, gambling, but mostly it will be about being a working mother. If you're looking for a podcast that will educate and inspire or one that will really make you think, this isn't the one for you. But it will be entertaining to a very select few because you don't make it to your mid-40s with IBS without having a story or two to tell. Join me as I take my place among podcast royalty like Joel Olstein and Lance Bass. Those are words I hope I'd never have to say. Listen to Toss Show on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy is the greatest murder mystery in American history. That's Rob Briner. Rob called me, Soledad O'Brien, and asked me what I knew about this crime. I know 60 years later, new leads are still emerging. To me, an award-winning journalist, that's the making of an incredible story. And on this podcast, you're going to hear it told by one of America's greatest storytellers. We'll ask... Who had the motive to assassinate a sitting president? My dad thought JFK screwed us at the Bay of Pigs, and then he screwed us after the Cuban Missile Crisis. We'll reveal why Lee Harvey Oswald isn't who they said he was. I was under the impression that Lee was being trained for a specific operation. Then we'll pull the curtain back on the cover-up. The American people need to know the truth. Listen to Who Killed JFK on the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, Chuck, so Genghis Khan has conquered Eurasia and said, what now? What now, Eurasia? What do you guys want to do now? I'm done with killing. Not really, though. <laughs> well, he died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess that's right. Yeah, and this is, uh, no one knows quite how he died still. Uh, some people say he had a fall from a horse and was injured, eventually died. Other people said it might have been typhus. There are a few other theories floating around out there, but. Yeah, like shot in the knee with an arrow is my favorite. Yeah, which I guess just oh. infection. I, I would die from pain. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting, though, in uh, August of 1227, when he was on his deathbed, like one of the last things he did was say, you know, remember the Tangets? <laughs> Go kill all of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's what he did. I think they were the first people he conquered, right? They were the Zhizhe, um people. Okay, the first people in China. And when he went to go um, go attack the Khwarezm Empire, yeah. he demanded that they send some troops as reinforcement, and they said no. He defeated the Khwarezm and um, turned around and went right over to Zhizha uh, and was like, you guys, are you're toast. Yeah. You're in trouble. And uh, that was his last act as, as uh, a living person. Yeah, he was succeeded by one of his son, uh, Ogedai. Who took that stuff all the way to Europe. Oh, yeah. He like He had a bunch of sons. Uh -huh. And I guess we might as well talk about his lineage. It's very famously the Genghis Khan. I mean, what is it, like one of every 200 men? Something like 0.5% of the total global population is directly descended from him. That's amazing. It's amazing and gross. <laughs> That's yeah. a lot of people. Yeah, he was about 65-ish when he died, and no one knows where he's buried. No. Because they killed everyone on the way to the, the funeral. That's one. And then also they rode over his his grave. With horses? I looked up. So have you, do you ever go on Quora? Uh, sure. Every it's, now and then. It's great, man. Yeah. Like, you can you can usually tell who knows what they're talking about yeah. of the answers, the multiple. And frequently, it's most of the people. It's, it's a very, it's a good, serious, like, it's a good place to get info that you should then go double check. Yeah, but I agree, though. It's not like the old days of, uh, what was the terrible one years and years ago where you would ask a question. Yahoo and, questions? Yeah, probably. Or <laughs> Yahoo, yeah, something like that. Yeah. 
There and there are a lot of platforms like this. Yeah. This is a pretty good. It's not corrupt yet. How about that? Yeah, I think Quora is pretty good actually. So um, I went on Quora. This one you can't really look up, but um, this one guy, two people. Like the question was, why was Genghis Khan buried in secret? I think, mm-hmm. and two people said um, they didn't want his grave robbed. Um, Makes sense. They wanted to make sure that the transfer of power to his son was complete, so they had to keep his death a secret. That makes sense. Yada, yada. This one guy said, don't be idiots. <laughs> he was a little arrogant, but he said, like, don't be idiots. Genghis Khan was a shamanistic person, religiously fervent. Yeah. He would have gone one of two ways. They would have cremated him and just spread his ashes or they would have done a sky burial. Remember we talked about oh, those sure. before? Where they just left him on the mountainside for the vultures to pick yeah. over. Um, they, they wouldn't have buried him with grave goods. He would have been embarrassed with that. So he's the only person I saw say something like that. Mm-hmm. But it, it gave me pause. It made me wonder if if the the hidden grave is just, you know, a just a, more lore yeah. about Genghis Khan and off the mark. Interesting. Yeah. Well, his legacy looms large still, not only in his uh, his uh, lineage from his loins. <laughs> <laughs> his overactive loin just leeching out goop. But <laughs> depending on who you're talking to, um, well, he definitely did some things. He opened up trade. Right. Um, the the West got things like noodles and tea and playing cards. Mm-hmm. He perhaps founded... The, the very first version of uh, what would later be a post office uh, with yeah. his, uh, what was it called, the Yam? Yeah, like the Pony Express. Yeah, like it just was different stations. The Pony Express. Yeah, like straight up. But like 600 years before the Pony Express. Yeah, exactly. But uh, depending on who you're talking to, some people lay almost all of modern warfare at his feet. Yeah. Which is sort of interesting because you can sort of draw a line back to his tactics mm-hmm. that in, eventually would become the Crusades mm-hmm. or the uh, the slaughtering of the Aztecs and the Incas. Yeah, so they say— Like they would learn from him and then do that. Right, because it was more of that cultural conveyor belt, that yeah. he, right? So they say that he conquered the Khwarezm Empire, came in contact with, with Islam— um, and taught them ferocity, which the Europeans learned during the Crusade, and they took that ferocity back to Europe and then eventually to the New World, which they used on the Native Americans they found there. And somebody said, um, no, the Europeans were already well-versed in ferocity and brutality and warfare. They didn't yeah. need to learn it from Genghis Khan. That doesn't mean that's wrong. Right. But it does, it, it's the suggestion that the Europeans were naive to brutality and warfare is, is in, incorrect. Well, it's complete BS. And um, the author of that article also makes a good point. And, like, you can't, you can't look and judge him by today's lens. He wasn't any more brutal than anyone else back then. It was just the number. Yeah, he just did it better. That to me, though, so I guess then maybe my problem is is like celebrating people who've killed tons of people. Yeah. Like, that's what I have a problem at at base. Sure. Because it's Caesar. great man great man history, you uh-huh. know? It bugs me. It bugs me, too. Sorry, we didn't come. We didn't come across that way, did we? No, but him? just 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 by carrying on the tradition of talking about this guy and, you know, there's it, you definitely keep his, his little flame burning. Well, and there's a what, 150-foot statue of him? Yeah. Like, he's still r- very much revered. Well, let's talk about that. There. Like, if you were in Mongolia right now, you're probably pretty mad at me and Chuck. Apologies for that. We're really, it's the great man history thing we have a problem with. But um, in Mongolia, he is known as the founder of Mongolia. Yeah. The, um, the great, basically the, great, the greatest leader Mongolia has ever known, and possibly the world if you're a Mongolian. Um, and during that, during the Soviet occupation of Mongolia, you were not allowed to talk about him. Yeah, they like took him out of history books. Yeah, because they were trying to stamp out any kind of nationalism in Mongolia at the yeah. time. So the moment the Soviets left, the Soviet Union dissolved, they were like, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan, Genghis Khan. Yeah. They built a statue of him. They named him an airport after him. They put him on currency. So he's definitely revered over there. But I think that the um, art, the the author of the article, I think his name's Frank McLinn. I'm almost positive. It's a it's really Frank. good article. Yeah, it's great. Frank McLinn. Um, he wrote this wonderful article called The Brutal Brilliance of Genghis Khan. 
But he he points out like whatever you think of the guy, even if he was the same as his contemporaries, and it still seems alien to you. Yeah. Like think about your own leaders. Your own leaders send people to 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 die on the battlefield too. Yeah. And for, they're revered as well. Sure, so, for causes that aren't not noble. Right. So the 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 point is is I guess don't hate on Genghis Khan. Hate hate the game. Not the player. Right. I guess so. Wow. Boy, this guy <laughs> took a deep left turn, didn't it? Well, it is interesting. Yeah, uh, you could talk about this dude forever. Yeah, he also makes the point, too, that the, the Mongols were um, what he called culturally unbalanced. So he's like, you know, at least the Europeans, while they were slaughtering and killing, were giving us the Divine Comedy and mm-hmm. Carmina Burana and mm-hmm. these great cathedrals and operas, whereas the Mongols were just barbarian raiders and butchers. All slaughter, no substance. That's a T-shirt. <laughs> Yeah, very famously too uh, in the movies, uh, Genghis Khan was played uh, twice, <laughs> once by John Wayne. Yep, believe it or not, in The Conqueror, and then Omar Sharif. Uh, okay. Said uh, Egyptian, also not close to Mongolian. Right. Um, I don't know if that's better or worse than John Wayne. It's probably the same. I think it's worse, or no, better. Better. <laughs> well, now. It'll be Hugh Jackman. <laughs> no, I think Hollywood's changed somewhat, but like five years ago, they would have been like, what about Jason Momoa? Or Matt Damon, put one of those Fu Manchu <laughs> mustaches on him. Or they just pick Momoa because like, he looks tough. Who's he? And he looks sort of ethnic. He's a guy that plays uh, Aquaman. Ah, I gotcha. And is on... Uh, Very versatile, He's in Game of Thrones. Probably, but... And I even looked up Mongolian American actors to see if there was anyone out there. Uh-huh. Who they could tap into, and I don't think there are a lot of them. Oh, okay. So there probably have to be some some good unknown. So speaking of looking like a, a Mongolian, okay, got okay. one last thing. Are you done? Oh, I'm done. The Mongolians were really, really good at propaganda, and one oh, of the ways that they showed this was in Iran, in modern day Iran, the mm-hmm. Khwarazm, man. Empire, mm-hmm. when they subjugated it, one of the things they did is they said, "We are we don't have an uh, alphabet. We don't write things down, but you guys do, and we want to put that to good use. You have great artists. We want you to do a history of the the Mongols." And the uh, scribe said, "Sure, we'll do that. And we want you to do a history of the world, all the great leaders in the world, all the great civilizations in the world. We want you to do those." So they did. They built this. They wrote this huge compendium, mm-hmm. a universal history of the world. But the Mongols had them illustrate, like illuminate the text, and they had them whenever they drew a leader or a conqueror or an army, they drew them as Mongols. Oh, interesting. So they insinuated themselves into history as basically the the progenitors of all greatness. And thus justified the subjugation mm-hmm. of this area. Wow. Um, and they did it through propaganda. They had like all that like copied, you know, hand copied and distributed as widely as they could. Wow. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. There you go. That's it. All right. Uh, if you want to know more about Mongolia or Genghis Khan or any of that stuff, you can type those words into the search bar at How Stuff Works. Pick up a book, you dingus. <laughs> and since Chuck said that, it's time for listener mail. Uh, hey, guys. Recently listened to the um, show about burying Ferraris. Want to share another cool story about an almost buried car. Uh, in 2013, Brazilian billionaire Count Chinquinho Scarpa... Uh, made headlines when he announced he wanted to bury his $500,000 Bentley. Oh, my. Like the pharaohs did with their precious possessions. So he could supposedly ride around the afterlife in style. Attracted tons of press and social media buzz, with many people outraged he would do something so selfish. Uh, on the day of the burial, tons of Brazilian press and media crews show up to his house to see him bury his Bentley. Huh. But moments before the car is lowered in the ground, the Count pulls a major plot twist and announces he won't be burying the car and he reveals true intention to create awareness uh, <laughs> for organ donation. Wow. Because people are buried with something valuable, their organs. And it was all a stunt 
and the use of social media and buzz marketing to create awareness for organ donation. That is fantastic, man. What a cool guy. Really interesting. Uh, anyway, guys, big fan of your show. Learned a lot from your stories over the years, so I wanted to take this chance to share this cool story with you. Uh, and that is from Kate Miller, who's looking forward to more stories. Yeah, thanks us. a lot, Kate. I definitely had not heard about that. It's a good one. Um, if you want to let us know a cool story, we want to hear it. You can tweet to us. I'm at Josh Um Clark and at SYSK Podcast. Uh, Chuck's on Facebook.com slash Movie Crush and slash Charles W. Chuck Bryant and slash Stuff You Should Know. You can send us all an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. And as always, join us at our home on the web, stuffyoushouldknow.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com. Hi, I'm Daniel Tosh, host of a new podcast called Tosh Show. I'll be interviewing people that I find interesting, so not celebrities, and certainly not comedians. We'll be covering topics like religion, travel, sports, gambling, but mostly it will be about being a working mother. If you're looking for a podcast that will educate and inspire, or one that will really make you think, this isn't the one for you. Listen to Tosh Show on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy is the greatest murder mystery in American history. That's Rob Briner. Rob called me, Soledad O'Brien, and asked me what I knew about this crime. We'll ask, who had the motive to assassinate a sitting president? Then we'll pull the curtain back on the cover-up. The American people need to know the truth. Listen to Who Killed JFK on the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.